Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody that's on the call from wherever you may be joining us. And thank you for joining us for this webinar towards the effective management of marine mammals in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, the Marine Mammals Management Toolkit. My name is Tom Dallison and I'm part of the Marine Mammals Twinning who created the Marine Mammals Management Toolkit, part of the EU funded Ocean Governance Project. And I'll be taking you through the webinar um, this afternoon or this evening. So firstly, just before we get started, um, some uh, some housekeeping. Um, for any urgent technical issues, please do use the chat function and myself or Francis Stolp will be able to assist you. Um, I kindly request that everybody keeps themselves muted um, throughout the course of the webinar. Um, but if you wish to speak or ask a question, uh, please do use the raise hand uh, feature in the reaction section um, and you'll be given the floor um, and be able to unmute yourself. Uh, for those that are listening and, of course, those that are speaking, um, if you do have a headset, um, it's recommended for uh, best quality um, and audio. Um, and the chat will be open and monitored throughout the webinar. Um, if you wish to ask questions in the chat, we do have a question and answer session scheduled towards the end of the webinar uh, where we can pick up um, any of those questions um, put in the chat. Or, of course, um, you'll be able to unmute yourself and, and ask those uh, questions directly to our speakers. Um, and just to note that the meeting is being recorded, um, so if you don't wish for your camera to be on the recording, um, then you can turn that off now. And lastly, I'm sure everybody is now aware of, of the functionality of Zoom, um, but you can access the raise the hand feature in the reaction ses section at the lower half of your screen on Zoom, um, and then you'll be given the floor um, to unmute yourself. So for the purpose of the webinar, just a quick run through of the agenda. Um, so welcome remarks, agenda and overview as we're going through now. And then I'll hand the floor over um, to Maha Amir um, for an introduction um, on the regional organisation for the conservation of the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. We'll then move into um, the importance of marine mammals in the region, as well as an overview of important marine mammal areas in the region um, by uh, Giuseppe Nortobartolo Discaria. We'll then look at the uh, Marine Mammals Management Toolkit provided by Francis Stoll, the core expert of the Marine Mammal Twinning. Um, and then I'll provide you with a guided use on the self-assessment tool and the satellite and how to understand and interpret your results. We'll then hear from Makami Makami regarding a testimonial on the use and application of the toolkit, specifically the self-assessment tool um, in Zanzibar. And then we'll open up for questions and answers and then we'll hand back over to Mahir for uh, closing us out on the webinar. So with all that being said, and hopefully everybody on the webinar is excited for, uh, for the speakers and all the topics we're going to discuss today, it's my pleasure to hand the floor over to Dr. Mahar Amir for the introduction on Perska. And Mahar Amir is the Regional Coordinator for Biodiversity and MPAs at Perska. So Mahir, the floor is all yours. Is the screen share now, Tom? Yeah, perfect, Mahir. Over to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Ocean Governance, uh, Marine Mammal twin, uh, Twinnings, and uh, thanks for all my colleagues in Perska Member State to participate in this important uh, uh, webinar on the Marine Mammals Management Toolkit, uh, Toolkits in uh, Perska region. I'll throw some light on Persica. What is Persica and what is uh, the mission and division of Persica? Uh, short minutes. Persica is the regional organization for the conservation of the environment of the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. It's an intergovernmental organization concerning or caring the protection of marine uh, uh, biodiversity and the sustainable uses of the marine resources. Persica member state 
Djibouti, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen. Our headquarters is based here in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia. And you also have an established marine emergency uh, mutual aid center for the Red Sea and Gulf, Gulf Aden, Emerska, in Hurghada, in Egypt. Our legal framework confirmed from Jeddah Convention 1892 and is attached to drive it regional protocols and is action plan that developed in 1982. Basically, carrying the Red Sea and Gulf Aden, where the Red Sea located in one of the most arid areas in the world. They have uh, high water temperature, high evaporation rate, high salinity, it's a deep sea, semi-enclosed, steep rocky, uh, have steep rocky boundaries, no outflowing rivers, that's lead to oligotrophic conditions, absence of uh, boiling. That's all these conditions lead to high rate endemic species. On the other hand, the Gulf Aden is subject to a seasonal upwelling because the, by the Somali current, which increases local rainfall, nutrient input, and ecological production. So the Gulf of Aden considered as one of the highest productive water bodies in, in the world. The global values of the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden includes the diversity of coral reef habitats, the central Red Sea, of Saudi Arabia, and the Sudan, the distinct geography and the number of endemic species in all the Red Sea, the unique coral reef around the Sinai Peninsula, the atoll-like formation of Sanganib Atoll in Sudan. There is an extensive stance of mangroves along both sides of the Red Sea and the Gulf Aden. There is also a population of dugong and the turtles in the central Red Sea. The unique biodiversity of Socotra Archipelago and the extensive stock of commercial fishes in the Gulf of Aden. Our legal framework based of Jeddah in, in 1982 Jeddah Convention and attached protocol on the regional cooperation in combating pollution by all other by oil and other harmful substances in the case of emergency and also there's a member state signing the action plan in 1982. In 2005, Persica member state signing two protocols, one for the protection of marine environment from land-based activities and the other for the conservation of biological diversity and establishment of marine protected area network. 2009, there is also a protocol over the exchange and the movement of personnel and the equipment across borders during emergency. 2011, there is an MOU for cooperation, border state control, and now there is a protocol for fisheries management and aquaculture, and we hope to member state signing on this protocol soon. Uh, the uh, Berska Regional uh, Action Plan that signed in uh, 1982. Yeah. The goal of this action plan is assessment of coastal marine environment, uh, guide uh, uh, members to sustainable resource management and the uh, and the legal base for cooperative efforts and support in institutional uh, mechanisms. This objectives uh, mainstreamed or implemented through Berska programs. That we have many Berska. Uh, Programs like biodiversity and the base programs as I have in charge in living marine resources program, regional monitoring program, land based activities, emergency care, adaptation to climate change, environmental education and awareness, annual training program, basic information system, and also we have uh, an on ground project uh, program for uh, solve the cross cutting uh, issue or the emerged uh, uh, issue. Uh, the protocol concerning the conservation of biological diversity and establishment of network protected area in the sea and Gulf Aden. The, the first uh, article uh, objectives is to provide the conservation, protection, and restoration of the health and integrity of ecosystem and the biological diversity. 
and also to safeguard the threatened species, the critical habitats, site of particular importance, as well as the representative types of coastal and marine ecosystem, their biodiversity and their sustainable uh, use and management. The, sorry. The, we have uh, the goal of, uh, we have uh, an action plan for marine protected area. The goal of this uh, marine protected area regional network is to the, develop regional capacity in all aspects of MBA planning and management, uh, provide the sustainable use of living marine resources, involve local communities, stakeholders as a partner in all MBA um, management and planning, and conserve representative and prime examples of the biodiversity and enhance <clears throat> uh, public awareness for marine resources and the biodiversity uh, of the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. In 2004, Perska published the standard survey in for. So sorry. Berska has published the standard severe method for key habitat and the key species in Red Sea and Gulf Aden, following this with currently used worldwide. This, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this published protocol or survey method include all uh, the survey method for uh, key species and the key habitat, and there's a uh, a complete chapters for the survey and the monitoring of marine mammals. In 2020, PERSC updated this standard survey method for key habitat and the key species, and by adding five chapters for new issues like monitoring of fisheries, monitoring of water quality, monitoring of our evaluation of management of picnics of marine protected area, and the uh, evaluation of participatory mapping technique for the Binsic uh, habitat. The chapter, uh, chapter nine that include the uh, marine mammal survey. Uh, uh, there are more than about 22 marine marine mammal species in the rest of the Gulf Aden. And I think uh, my colleagues, Dr. Giuseppe, will uh, uh, describe this in details. <clears throat> also, the, the protocol uh, of this uh, chapter of uh, marine mammals include the method for survey of uh, marine mammals. You can select the method you, uh, that's suitable for your, uh, uh, your logistic and your uh, <coughs> experts. Also, the, the, this uh, uh, chapter include identification guide for all species by drawing the skulls and the skeleton uh, skeleton the system of the all 22 mammal species in the area the old measurement also indicated in this chapter and there's many catalogs for the the marine mammal species that occurred in this catalog and I think dr Giuseppe will explain this in uh, detail. That is uh, what uh, happened during the uh, uh, last uh, two years, two, uh, three, uh, four, two years for updating the method of marine mammals uh, survey in uh, Persica region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Meher. And uh, I think, uh, Everybody on the call recognizes the, the, the importance of the region, not, not only for coral reefs, as you mentioned, and also marine mammals, but also for biodiversity on a global scale as well. And I think Perska has, has an in, instrumental role um, in the conservation, uh, protection and, and restoration of, of, of marine life. And I think also um, capacity development and building as, 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 as you exampled um, with the um, with the resources uh, recently yes. released for monitoring. So uh, thank you very much um, for your uh, for your presentation. So on that note, um, and if anybody has any questions for uh, for Dr. Meher, please do hold on to them, put them in the use the chat function um, or um, hold on to them for the question and answer session um, towards the end. 
um, of the webinar, we'll, we'll, we'll happily go through those and answer those questions for you. So following on from, from, from his presentation, um, it's my pleasure to be able to, to give the floor to uh, Dr. Giuseppe uh, Notabotolo di Scariara um, for the importance of the marine mammals and important marine mammals, uh, marine mammal areas, sorry, um, in the region. So uh, Giuseppe, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? We can see your screen. Just need to put it in presenter mode and all yes. good. Over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to present uh, this uh, webinar. I am very happy to be able to talk about the marine mammals in the Red Sea. Um, and um, uh, let me first make... Uh, uh, um, I, I want to premise that I, I'm going to speak mostly about cetaceans. As you know, there are two main groups of marine mammals in the main, in the in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Uh, there are cetaceans, and uh, there is one species of sirenians, the dugong. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, too much about the dugong. Um, uh, that um, uh, already Dr. Mahir has uh, mentioned. Um, it's a single species of Serenian uh, that um, uh, is found uh, in both uh, parts, parts of the region. Uh, and uh, as far as the Red Sea is concerned, um, I understand that the main population is in the east side in, the, in Saudi uh, Arabian uh, waters. Um, uh, on the west side, Egypt, Sudan, and Eritrea, it is also present, but um, uh, in, in much smaller groups than the uh, than the eastern part, as far as I know. I I am not aware of uh, very recent uh, uh, surveys and um, and determinations about the uh, the presence of the uh, of the dugong in the Red Sea. Uh, as far as cetaceans are concerned, the situation is much more diverse, as you can see from this first slide. And also there is a huge difference between the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea in terms of the presence of species. Uh, in the Gulf of Aden, you see that all the species uh, listed here are present. Uh, I am not sure whether uh, which one of these species are regular and which one are occasional because research in the Gulf of Aden on marine mammals and cetaceans in particular is has not been done uh, sufficiently intensely. Uh, as far as the Red Sea is concerned, um, these are the, uh, the cetacean species that are, I know that are being recorded in the Red Sea. Uh, the, uh, the ones on top are regularly occurring in the Red Sea in various ways, and the others are uh, uh, presumed to be only occasionally occurring. So coming in from the south, from the uh, from the uh, Indian Ocean, I'm going to go very quickly through the different species just to give you a sense of, of what they are. Uh, the only baleen whale, misty sea, is the Brindus whale, and um, um, I am including in these slides maps that uh, we had published on a. Uh, report on the cetaceans from the Red Sea that um, uh, was made by uh, by the uh, Convention on Migratory Species, and that uh, can be downloadable from the internet. Uh, this report was published, I believe, in 2015, um, and uh, so uh, it is already uh, a few years ago, and there might be that um, uh, the uh, information in this uh, maps um, has been uh, in, improved in in, pa in subsequent years, but I'm not sure about that. I don't have information about that, so I will give the situation of about you know, a few years ago. So you see that the uh, the British whale occurs a little bit everywhere, uh, from the south to the north, and uh, and of course another thing I want to mention is that this information is. Uh, based on the observations that were made there. 
and the observations that were made there are in large part anecdotal. They are um, in very few places. Sorry, somebody is speaking. In, in very few places in the Red Sea, there has been a uh, systematic observation made of, uh, of cetaceans. So we must uh, keep this into account when we look at these maps. Uh, passing now onto odontocytes, uh, there are, are you know several odontocytes as you remember. Uh, this is the Indo-Pacific common dolphin, <laughs> Delphinus delphis tropicalis. It's a common dolphin with a very, very long snout. Uh, in the um, uh, in the map in the world map below, you have to keep into consideration that this map was made for long beak common dolphins in general. So there is also uh, you know uh, the occurrence in 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 the American continent and in uh, Atlantic, but this in the Pacific common dolphin is only occurring in the Indian Ocean and uh, and uh, West Pacific and including of course the the Red Sea. In the Gulf of Aden. Um, then we have the Rhesus dolphin that can, you can see from the uh, map of the Red Sea is uh, it's not very common, but it's spread everywhere uh, in the in 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 the region in the Red Sea. Uh, false killer whales are also uh, even a little less common than uh, uh, commonly observed than the uh, Rhesus dolphin, but also found. Uh, throughout uh, the Red Sea. Uh, we have more information from the northern part because we have more observations perhaps from the northern part. Uh, the Indian Ocean humpback dolphin um, is a very coastal uh, animal that can be seen in, uh, you know, very close to the coast in a few meters of water. And also it occurs throughout the Red Sea. Uh, the pantropical sp spotted dolphins is more Pelagic. In this picture, you can see two species. The one, uh, the one, this one is the pantropical spotted dolphin, and and these two is the mother and calf uh, of uh, spinner dolphin. Uh, they were photographed of Egypt in a mixed uh, group. Uh, so you see this uh, from the map. You can see that the animal is uh, very frequent and uh, and mostly found in uh, in deeper waters. Uh, spinner dolphins are also very, very common in the uh, in the Red Sea. Um, as you can see from the world map, they are widely distributed across the circumtropical belt, and uh, and they are find uh, they are they are very commonly found in the Red Sea. Uh, then we have two bottlenose dolphins. This is in the Pacific bottlenose dolphin, very close to the coast. Um, we know that it occurs throughout the Red Sea, although most of the observations we have are from the north and from Egypt. And uh, and then the common bottlenose dolphins uh, that um, is also found uh, in, in the Red Sea a little further from the coast, perhaps. They are very difficult to tell apart unless you, you are an expert of the species. And then uh, the ones we just saw are the regular species. Then we have the occasional species. The, Humpback whale has been seen. Uh, reports mostly come from the northern part uh, in Egypt, uh, but uh, these are uh, animals that live in the Indian Ocean and come into the uh, Red Sea rarely. Then uh, uh, this is uh, a pygmy sperm whale that uh, stranded of Eritrea. Again, it's very likely an animal that came in from uh, the Indian Ocean. Killer whales occasionally enter uh, the Red Sea. They've seen mostly the south because they are coming in from, from there. Short fin pilot whale uh, has been very rarely seen, but it occurs in the Red Sea. And uh, rough to the dolphin, this is an animal that's stranded in Eritrea. It was provided by our colleague uh, Mebrathu. And uh, a striped dolphin uh, very rarely has been seen, but it has been seen in the, in the Red Sea as well. There are a few species that are very, very uh, widely distributed in the world, but do not occur in the Red Sea as far as we know. And uh, the most um, outstanding one is the, uh, is the sperm whale. Uh, we have no record from the Red Sea. Uh, <coughs> 
nor we do, do we have records from the Red Sea of the big quails like the um, Cuvier big quail here and the uh, uh, the um, and the other two species. Now, I wanted to uh, also touch on the um, concept of important marine mammal areas, which is a program that has been carried forward by the Marine Mammal Protected Areas Task Force of IUCN. Uh, important marine ma mammal areas are not marine protected areas. They're just uh, areas that are being uh, identified only on the basis of scientific criteria. And they are there to uh, uh, display uh, areas that are potentially uh, useful uh, to be set, set up for management and conservation uh, because of the uh, of their importance for uh, one or more marine mammal populations. Um, in uh, 2019, we had a workshop uh, on the uh, EMAS, important marine mammal areas of the Western Indian Ocean, including the Red Sea. And uh, here you can see in yellow the um, the areas that uh, were then uh, admitted as uh, EMAS uh, by an independent uh, independent uh, review panel. And the, uh, uh, the blue areas are areas of interest uh, because they were not deemed to uh, be uh, uh, considered important areas because of uh, uh, they still needed uh, some uh, greater uh, scientific uh, information, some more robust scientific information for being uh, considered important marine mammal areas. Looking at the criteria, just to give you a small idea, uh, there are one the one criterion about the vulnerability of a species of population living in 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 the Nima. Uh, then uh, the, there is uh, other two sub criteria uh, concerning distribution and abundance, small and resident population and aggregations, um, criteria about key uh, life cycle areas, reproductive feeding of migration, and then special attributes. Just to give you a very, very quick idea about what the criteria are for the identification of EMAS. Uh, now, looking at the Red Sea, of course, the you have to keep in mind that the um, the identification of EMAS in the Red Sea has depended very much on the experts that we were able to uh, uh, to to get at the um, at the EMA workshop uh, that we had in 2019, um, and uh, uh, so these are the three uh, EMAs that were identified, uh, the Northern Red Sea Island EMA, the Southern Egyptian Red Sea Base of Shore Reefs and Islands EMA, and the Farasan Archipelago EMA. Uh, as far as the uh, areas of interest that um, uh, we hope we will be able to uh, have opportunities for uh, looking uh, with greater detail in the future, we have the Dungona Bay, Mukawar Island uh, areas of interest, the Swakin Archipelago and Sudanese Southern Red Sea, uh, the Dalak and adjacent Southern Waters AOI, the Djibouti AOI, and the Gulf of Aden and Socotra Archipelago AOI. Looking at uh, them one by one, the IMAS, not the areas of interest, so in the Northern Red Sea Islands IMA, we, we have uh, the qualifying species are the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins and Indian Ocean humpback dolphin. And he, there you have the criteria by which they were identified. And then uh, the area uh, is also important for a number of other species that occur there, like the dugong, the uh, rhesus dolphin, humpback whale has been seen there, et cetera, et cetera. The uh, Southern Egyptian Red Sea base of shore reefs and islands Ima. Uh, this area was actually subject to uh, regular um, uh, surveys uh, in which it was possible also to determine the actual size of the populations of, uh, of, of dolphins. Uh, the qualifying species and criteria, we have the dugong, Indian Ocean humpback dolphin, rhesus dolphin, spinner dolphin, Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin, and common bottlenose dolphin. 
And then you see there is also a large number of other species that occur there, but um, uh, some of them don't have necessarily habitat. Um, and uh, finally, the uh, Farasan archipelago Ima, uh, where you have, again, uh, a number of species. Uh, they are listed, the British whale, the uh, Indian Ocean humpback dolphin, spinner dolphin, Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin, and the dugong. Uh, as far as the areas of interest that, uh, as, as you remember, they need more more information to be uh, identified as imas. Uh, we have uh, the Dungona Bay has, because of the uh, common bottlenose dolphin, the common dolphin and the dugong. Uh, the Swakin Archipelago, uh, again, uh, the uh, Indian Ocean uh, bottlenose, the uh, common dolphins, spinner dolphin and the dugong. Dugong is everywhere in these areas. Uh, the Dalak and adjacent uh, southern waters uh, is the um, uh, in, in Indian Ocean uh, humpback dolphin, spinner dolphin, dugong, and uh, Ridus whale. In Djibouti, the dugong, and the Gulf of Aden, the dugong. And with this, uh, I think I'm done. Yes. And um, I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Um, excellent to to have such an extensive overview in such a short space of time as well. Um, I'm sure uh, we could talk for a very long time about the richness and biodiversity, especially marine mammals um, and, and cetaceans in the region. But and I think uh, the breadth of biodiversity uh, really demonstrates the need for effective management and conservation practices as well through through IMAs, through um, sort of local actions and, and, and regional uh, marine spatial management as well. So um, just before we move on to the marine mammals, uh, sort of toolkit for an introduction from Francis, um, I, I note in the chat that um, I may give the floor for two minutes to um, to Somalia, for our colleagues from Somalia, just to provide a, 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 a quick overview of marine mammals in, in Somalia, um, responding to, to Giuseppe's presentation. And then also, uh, Tariq, I see your hand is, is up as well, so we'll also take your question. But um, Garad, um, Ali, um, please do feel free to take the floor for a, for a brief overview of marine mammals in Somalia. Hello, everyone. Great. My name is uh, William. And, uh, provide uh, some information related mammals to Somalia. Great, we uh, have the floor. Yeah, uh, thank you, Director Ali. My name is Great Abdullahi from Somalia, Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, I want to brief from uh, Marine Mammals Management Tool. Somalia focuses uh, conservation and sustainable management of marine mammals population within the country, uh, coastal and offshore waters. Tolki aims to provide this comprehensive framework from the protection and management of marine mammals, while also supporting the economic development of Somalia, coastal communities. Uh, the following section is outline essential communities. Uh, the, the first state is a legal and regulatory framework. So Somalia, we need from the legal and regulatory framework as a protection status for retaining marine mammals, monitoring and control and surface measures, cooperation with regional partnership, uh, just like Persega. Uh, the other case is uh, identification and monitoring, uh, national database registration of surface and collaboration with uh, yeah, the scientists as well as international organizations. Uh, when uh, it, the focus of Somalia is uh, uh, public awareness and programs like educational materials and campaign type it is communities, schools, and fisheries, uh, promoting marine mammals, ecotourism, sustainable economic activities. Uh, and we need from the capacity building and training like spatial identifications, monetary techniques, law enforcement procedures, uh, and the future we need from the investment in research 
to fill the gap is a knowledge about marine. Uh, when we are talking from Somalia, we have uh, opportunities and weakness. So our opportunity is a biodiversity, a rich biodiversity. Somalia water home, various species for marine mammals such as whales, dolphin, droughties. So management can protect species, contributing marine biodiversity, conservation, and promoting ecotourism. And the other case is a strange in ecosystem health, improving conservation and management efforts. Marine mammals can contribute to overall ecosystem health, benefiting both local communities and the surrounding environment. Uh, the other case is economical potential, a responsible development of marine resources through proper management lead to growth, ecotourism, and associated industries. Uh, our Somali weakness is a limited resource, financial limited, poses significant challenges for effective marine mammals conservation. Uh, the other one is uh, insufficient data, limited researches to local marine mammals. Population is making it difficult to, for resource managers to develop adaptive management strategy. Uh, the other third is uh, social economic factors. Buffety, unemployment, and competing priorities for resources may result in local communities' options for short term resource extraction rather than investing in long term sustainable management efforts. Uh, my in conclusion, money mammalist management tool present is valuable opportunities for Somalia to promote. So thank you everyone and give me a chance to brief from Somalia. Welcome Director Ali. Thank you, uh, Mr. Grant. Uh, I am Mr. Ali Hassan. I would like to add Somalia uh, was meeting problem of uh, IUU. Uh, illegal unregulated uh, and unregulated fishing uh, in Somalia. And that has affected the so mammals uh, in our uh, ocean and uh, Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. And uh, really, I appreciate Persaga of uh, establishing this very vital meeting. And uh, we will uh, be here and participate. And any question is asked to Somalia, we are likely to provide uh, it is uh, reasonable uh, answers. Thank you, and uh, turn it to you to the floor. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Gradily and Ali Hassan. Uh, very valuable to hear your experiences and, and the situation in Somalia, and um, hopefully with respect to uh, capacity building concerning identification, and then I encourage you, of course, to reach out to Giuseppe and, 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 the, and the team, and hopefully with respect to the uh, effective management of marine mammals, that hopefully uh, one of the possible tools that, that you could yes, uh, implement. Yes, Tom, um, uh, yes, yes, Tom I would like to add, I would like to add, we have also our expert, Dyer here, and he can provide some related issues about mammals in Gulf of Adan, uh, so I would like to give him uh, some uh, minutes if you allow for me. If we can, if we can make it very brief, because we need to we need to move on with the with the um, with the agenda, and we have two two hands up as well. So if it can be very very brief remarks. Um, okay, 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 okay. I'll uh, proceed. Ali. Ali. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Anyone can hear me? We we can hear you. Okay. Fine. Uh, 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 can I proceed? Yes. Yes. Okay, we can keep it very brief so we can, we can move. Okay, okay. Uh, 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 thank you. Welcome, uh, uh, thank you, uh, moderators, and also my colleagues uh, in the online, uh, which is very important for this uh, 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 important workshop. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to summarize uh, my colleagues and other uh, groups who are in, in the, this meeting. Actually, uh, I just uh, 
get it, uh, you know, on the last presentation for uh, the, uh, the, thought, uh, uh, the, the thought who has been uh, given us. Uh, when you are given to you uh, the, the, the geographical area of marine mammals, especially in the Red Sea uh, and the Gulf of Aden, uh, the recently uh, we have visited in the Gulf of Aden, in the area of uh, Berbera, and also uh, Saila, and up to the close to border of Djibouti, I and uh, Professor uh, Gil, uh, Gil, Prolik, uh, Gil Tracy Prolik, and everybody know that, uh, she's a professor of the marine mammals. Actually, we have found uh, a lot of the dolphin, a lot of the whales, a lot of the doggones. So even the sawfish is around there. So uh, to doing the capacity building, for the community-led initiatives, that is what we have found and our gap that during the last, last year assessment we are doing. Actually, uh, as our colleague, they mentioned it, we need a funding support. We have a guideline of toolkits of the marine mammals, either it is uh, uh, Indian Ocean uh, whale or humpback whales, either is uh, any other marine mammals we have are toolkits, uh, which is providing us uh, the uh, 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 gil gils. Uh, just only we need to translate uh, these uh, guidelines. We have our guideline books of the marine mammals. So we want to translate this and also do some capacity building for our community. Uh, let people they know what is the importance of the marine mammals to the ocean? What is the related in the marine mammals? We know people, they're not, aware, they're not aware that the marine mammals is a food whip of our oceans. If there is no mammals, there is no fish because uh, uh, the mammals, they, they feed the fish and, fish and fish feed us. So I, I would like to recommend uh, in certain area of Gulf of Aden, where it's now in geographical, it's very peaceful, to conduct such as uh, awarenesses and also giving capacity to our society. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much for your comments. And again, um, very valuable to hear the experiences from um, from Somalia. And, and and I encourage you, of course, to um, to reach out to directly to our speakers that are on this webinar and, and as well you can reach out to to us uh, with respect to um, the marine mammals management toolkit also so um just very very briefly and Tarika, uh, uh, my apologies i know you had your hand up for a while um if if, if you have a very brief comment um the f I'll, I'll happily hand you the floor um but if not then we'll we'll move on to our next agenda item but um Tariq, if you if you're still there yes yes you hear me we can indeed yeah, yeah. I have only a comment. I, I say thank you for Dr. Zubia's uh, presentation. I want to mention in Saudi Arabia, he did do it for 2032 about uh, uh, megafauna survey for whole region for uh, Red Sea. We are mentioned for something about the Perilla well. We found like uh, some area, we found uh, uh, some uh, two or three well with the calf. Okay. With this important for us, we found like uh, we are we are now do it calculate this data. We publish it uh, this year uh, for uh, the facility for the dog, for the mammals for dugon for the dolphin and the whale. We have another uh, plan for studying the 2024 to 25 for study the population and the species for the for marine mammals uh, for two or three years. This is what I want to mention for Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tree. Um, and again, my, my same response. I think after after this webinar, we'll we'll, we'll disseminate uh, further resources, and also um, we can we can help with connections um, for for further exchanges as well and discussions of experiences, which I think. Um, is one of the key values of these of these webinars and connecting people. So um, again, thank you very much, everybody, for the comments. Um, and Giuseppe, again, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, Ahmed, I do see your hand, but unfortunately, we need to we need to move forward on 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 the agenda. But we do have some time later as well to make some um, further comments and questions. So um, in the in the essence of time, um, it's my pleasure to be able to welcome uh, Francis Stor um, for the floor. Um, who is the core expert um, of the Marine Mammal Twinning um, and the Marine Mammal Twinning of developers of the Marine Mammals Management Toolkit. So, uh, Francis, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, thank you, uh, Maya, for the introduction and helping us to organize this webinar. Like it has only been uh, 40 minutes, but a lot of interest, a lot of questions. So I think we can be happy about this. I think this was a, it's, it was, and it's still a useful day webinar. And also thank you for the presentation of Giuseppe. Like uh, not being a marine mammal specialist, I've learned a lot of things. So thank you so much. This, this was great. So as Tom said, like uh, I'm going to try to make it brief because I think there is a lot of questions. So I prefer that people uh, exchange and interact than me talking for too long. I'm just going to briefly uh, introduce you what, what we call the Marine Mammals Management Toolkit. So next slide, Tom, sorry, thank you. So this, this toolkit was developed within the framework of a EU funded project, which is the EU Ocean Governance Project. This, uh, this project had four components. One was to enhance cooperation with MPA. One was to support uh, ecosystem restoration. So this activity was more in Southeast Asia, so I won't talk about it. The other one was to facilitate uh, cooperation uh, between uh, for marine and coastal resilience again in Southeast Asia, so I won't talk about it. And the fourth uh, component was really like to contribute to effective management of MPA. So this is uh, exactly what we're going to, to do. Next slide, please. So the, the Marine Mammal Toolkit was developed under Component 2. The aim of the Component 2 was to improve management of marine protected area around the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, despite the project started around the Atlantic Ocean, now it's, it's worldwide. So this is one of the reasons we are trying to expand and we are doing uh, this webinar with the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. Mohamed, can you please mute yourself, please? Thank you. Sorry. And uh, and so the, the Marine Mammal Toolkit was developed under the component C2. Next slide, please. So the aim of the Marine Mammal Tuning, which develops the Marine Mammal Toolkit, so the first was to develop technical capacity of SPA manager by sharing knowledge, expertise, and good practice. So, so far, I've heard a lot of need for capacity building in, in the discussion and comments. So I think we, I think using the toolkit can be one way to bridge this, but I'm sure there's lots of things to do. It was also to provide MPM manager with effective tools to improve the management of marine mammals. And the last aim of the, of the, of the twinning was to create a community of practice where MPM manager can network, share knowledge, experience, and idea. Next slide. Uh, I, I always like to show this slide because I think it's important, as, uh, as I said, when I, uh, when I told Giuseppe Vata, I learned a lot of things because I was not a marine mammal specialist. Uh, this is true, and that's why uh, since Nortom or I are marine mammal specialists, we, we talked and we gathered a core team of partners who are specialists in marine mammal management. So we have MPS such as the Agua Sanctuary, which is a sanctuary in the Caribbean, we had uh, the MPA manager from Iroise Marine Park, which is a sanctuary in, uh, in, in France. We had Stellwagen Bank, National Marine Sanctuary, so which is next Boston, USA. And, and again, it's a, it's a sanctuary where there is a lot of marine mammals. And we also had like the Yari Marine Mammal sh Shark and Sanctuary. So we, we had input from a lot of MPA managers. We also have input from government of Cap Verde, government of Bermuda or government of Canada. And we had also like some experts like from University of Iceland who is doing a lot of work on marine mammals. They are trying to set up the first uh, MPA in Iceland. So hopefully it will come soon. We had ASCOBAM, we have the International Whaling Commission, uh, Whale and Dolphin Conservation, uh, uh, and an, an over European funded project on marine mammals. So again, like all this work has been done with specialists working on the on the topic and and being like on the ground and facing marine mammal management and and protection on our daily work. Next slide, Tom, please. So what is the toolkit? So so the marine mammal. So so, so the toolkit is a was developed for the inclusion of marine mammals into MPA. The aim of the toolkit is to help develop technical capacity of MPA manager by sharing knowledge, expertise, and good practice. There is four main components of this toolkit, the fact sheet, the self-assessment tool. I won't talk too much about the self-assessment tool because Tom will give you a, a presentation about it. The community of practice and, and, the good, and the 
the climate of practice, sorry, and the good practice. Thank you. Next slide. So this is the home page of the Marine Moment Toolkit. We will post the URL on the chat. Uh, what 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 we did on this slide is to show that it's available in over 29 language. So hopefully you can find uh, your language by using the translation uh, option, which is like on the bottom of the home screen. Next slide, Tom, please. So fact sheet. So there is like currently there is 24 fact sheet. Uh, the fact sheet were designed to accompany the self-assessment tool. Uh, the fact sheet are constantly evolving and we're always trying to, to incorporate new resources, new case studies. The latest fact sheet we did uh, is on uh, climate change. And basically what are fact sheets? They are like uh, three to four pages about one topic. All the topics are uh, around the five core theme, which is management framework, addressing activity and threat, Reaches and monitoring, outreach and engagement, and management effectiveness. Next slide, please. So just to show you what, what is a fact sheet. So this is like the example of the fact sheet on climate change implication of marine mammal management. So basically you've got a, an introduction like explaining you what is a fact sheet about and the and, and the topic. Next slide, please. In most of the fact sheets, we'll have one or, or two case studies, like about like how the problem was addressed. Next slide, please. And the last part of the fact sheet is a is a list of links uh, of useful resources uh, related to the to the topic. It's a very very brief description of what is a fact sheet, but I think uh, is the easiest for you to to better understand what the fact sheet are is just to to go on the website. Next slide, please. So we, we also like decided to to create a community your practice. So it's a forum to discuss ideas, challenge, and management solution. And, and it creates, I think, like a, an opportunity to, to network around effective management for, for marine mammal toolkit. For marine mammal management, sorry, and especially for users of the self assessment tool. Uh, it's, a, it's a forum, it's free to join, it's very easy to join. And, and after we, we moderate some of the message, so so you, you, you're happy to, to join the community of practice. Next slide, please. The other thing is we, we are starting to, to develop good practice around the marine mammal management and conservation. So, so, so far we have four good practice. Uh, we are always looking for a new good practice. So if you, if you think you could contribute, please don't hesitate, share, share with us your topic. We'll be happy to work with you. And they're all available on the website. Next slide, please. And uh, we're also developing some supporting resources to, to, to better uh, to facilitate the use of the toolkit. So we are we are currently developing like a series of online tutorial video about how to use the toolkit, how you to use the fact sheet, how to use the self-assessment tool. So so far we have three videos posted, and we are, and we we are currently are going to develop like one or two more. Next slide, please. One one thing I think it's also important to mention it's a, it's a, the self assessment tool or, or the toolkit. It's also a good way to contribute to uh, international targets of the newly adopted uh, Cumming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So among the target uh, that the toolkit is contributing, there is target one, there is target three, everybody heard about target three, 30 by 30. There is target four and there is target 21. So I think it's also a good way like, to, to justify the use of the toolkit. Like you can, you can try to reach a CBD target. It's also contribute to the CMS strategic plan 2015-2023. Uh, Thank you, next slide. So I think it's my last slide or my before last slide. So ju just how, how you can get involved. So you, you're welcome, as I said, like to join the community of practice and share you, 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 your experience. You're always welcome to propose new topic for the fact sheet or, or based on your experience uh, to, to review some of the fact sheet. You can always submit also to good practice or case studies. And, and as we did with Pers Guy, you, you, we're always willing to help facilitate organizing webinar either at the national or, or regional level. So if, if you would like, like 
maybe like a, a webinar for your country, we're always happy to, to do this. Thank you. Next slide. So it was indeed my next slide. So I think like the easiest way is for you like to go on the on the URL to look at the website. And if you have any question, like don't hesitate, we are always here to help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis, um, for that uh, speedy introduction to, to the toolkit. Um, and I fully agree with Francis. I think the, the, the best way to become acquainted with the toolkit and explore all of its various uh, resources and components is to, is to visit the toolkit online um, yourselves as well. And of course, reach out to us if you have any questions. So following on from Francis, and as Francis mentioned, I'm going to provide you with a, a very quick overview of one of the core components of the toolkit, which is the self-assessment tool. Um, and also in the same light, I would really like to leave um, enough time for, for, for some further questions and discussion. So I'll, I'll go through this fairly, fairly quickly. Um, but again, we are available to answer and, uh, any further questions that you may have. Um, so the self-assessment tool was really uh, designed um, to enable MK managers to understand uh, the level of protection or the level of inclusion of marine mammals um, in, in MPA or sanctuary management plans. Um, and whilst we appreciate there are many other tools available, such as um, the INET or the MET4, um, after a review of existing tools, um, whilst marine mammals were referenced in those tools, um, there was no specific tool dedicated for marine mammals. And um, as we've seen from um, Giuseppe and, and, and uh, his presentations um, that um, there is great need for the conservation of marine mammals um, and especially in the region in terms of their rich biodiversity. So uh, the self-assessment tool provides a dedicated uh, means for understanding uh, the management effectiveness of management plans for marine mammals. Uh, the self-assessment tool is available offline in an Excel format and it's also available online as well in a web-based format. And in essence, it is a range of multiple choice questions and your answers to those questions are awarded a mark and those marks at the end are analyzed and you are presented with a dashboard of results across those five core themes that Francis mentioned from management effectiveness and management framework through to activities and threats, outreach engagement and research and monitoring. Um, and whilst the toolkit is available in lots of languages and um, the self-assessment tool is available in French, Spanish and English. Um, so very quickly, um, in terms of that dashboard in those results that, that you are able to access once you've completed the self-assessment tool, it allows you to understand not only uh, where there may be gaps in your management plan that may need addressing for the benefit of marine mammals, but it also demonstrates where your management plan um, has strengths or where it's uh, more effective, so to speak, in conserving marine mammals. It can be done spatially in a sort of snapshot, but it can also be done over time as well. So once you've undertaken a, a self-assessment and then you implement further management actions under your management plan, you can then reassess um, your, manage, uh, your management plan and hopefully um, see um, an improvement in terms of your management effectiveness. And in doing this process, it allows for um, adaptive management and of course, monitoring and evaluation, communication with funders, and of course, communication with ministries, governments, um, as well as looking further um, in terms of those global targets and contributions. So as Francis mentioned, this is the this is the toolkit. Everything is available online. Um, and to assess uh, access, sorry, the self-assessment tool, you can find the button um, on the top uh, menu um, online. So once you click on that page, um, this is what you will be greeted with. So there's a small introduction to the self-assessment tool, but what you're really interested in is those uh, four selections on the bottom underneath the associated document section. So here you can see the different self-assessment tools that are available. We have English, French, and Spanish, and you'll note the versions there as well to ensure that you're always using the most up-to-date version. And you also have a link to the web-based uh, SAT as well. And if you decide to use the web-based version, it's exactly the same, but you can access the program in the bottom right-hand corner, again, under associated, under associated documents. But for, for this very quick overview and run-through of the self-assessment tool, I'm going to use the example of the Excel-based version. So 
as with anything online, um, you need to download the file. Um, once you click on your chosen language, uh, you'll be directed um, to download the file. And once you open that file, please ensure that you enable macros. By enabling macros, um, it allows the, the, uh, the self-assessment tool to generate your results and your dashboard. There are various pages um, in the self-assessment tool that you'll be first greeted with. The first one being a simple form just to record your name, your email, mobile, number your contact information, and also importantly, the date in which you undertake the assessment. Um, you can then use the uh, contents page to quickly jump between all the various pages and themes in the self-assessment tool. But normally, uh, the, the, the normal route would be to move towards your MPA uh, metadata. So here, just asking for really important information on the attributes of your MPA, so the country it's located, its location, coordinates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, important to note its status, um, its ISN category, if possible, and also type of government, governance, size, uh, total surface area management authority, et cetera, et cetera. On this page, on the right hand side, you'll notice um, that there are some answer guides as well, really just to sort of help you uh, fill out um, this form um, and those areas on the left hand side. You'll also note at the bottom we have key marine mammal species, uh, the main uses in and around the MPA and the main pressures. Um, your answers here don't influence the, the follow-up questions in the self-assessment tool. This is really just for um, a capacity building exercise or an identification exercise to, to have the assessor thinking about um, possible key species or the main uses um, and main pressures in the MPA. But this is completely arbitrary, um, but just for the benefit of the assessor or the assessing team. So once you've completed uh, that section and inputted all your, all your necessary data, you can then move into the actual question and answer section of the self-assessment tool. So here I'm using the uh, example of the addressing activities and threats theme. Um, and as you can see on the left column, we have a set of questions under various sub-themes. So here we have uh, uh, well watching and also noise management. And then in the middle column is where you'll input your answers um, to the respective questions. And as you can see, it's very simple. It's a drop down menu um, and most questions, most answers, sorry, are yes or no. You'll also see that there is a not applicable um, and this was introduced to essentially allow uh, managers or assessors um, to identifies specific questions or activities that may not be applicable in their MPA. Previously, this wasn't available, so assessors had to answer no, and that resulted in a reduced um, score and impact on their scores um, in the dashboard. But now you can use not applicable and it will not influence your score. So most answers are fairly simple. But in other areas, uh, for example, on research and monitoring um, regarding baseline knowledge, you can see that some questions um, are a bit more expanded, uh, some answers, sorry, a bit more expanded um, and maybe a bit more subjective. So whilst, um, whilst you may be undertaking the self-assessment on your own, we highly encourage that you do this with colleagues or you do it in a group, or once you've undertaken the assessment that you discuss your answers um, either within your organization or between ministries. Um, this is simply because of possible subjectivity um, around um, particular answers and questions. So this is the same format for all the five core themes of the um, of the uh, toolkit management framework, addressing activities and threats, outreach and engagement, research and monitoring, and management effectiveness. So once you've answered all of your questions and provided answers throughout the five core themes, you can then move through to look at your results through the dashboard. So very quickly, uh, we can see in the top left hand corner, we have the scores which are broken down across those five core themes. So in this example, we scored quite well, actually, in management framework with a, with a score of 80, um, 80, 80, 81 um, percent. And you can see that breakdown across those five themes. On the right hand side, we can see something called the management effect of the scoring. And in this case, this MPA scored 6.91. Now, it's very important to note that this management effectiveness score is arbitrary and it's for the benefit of the MPA that is being assessed. So when we're looking at those temporal um, or over time assessments, hopefully you can see changes in this score. This score wasn't designed to compare MPAs between each other and say this MPA is better than that MPA because management plans differ 
um, objectives differ and the local situation of those MPAs um, differ as well. So it's really for the benefit of the MPA, not to compare MPAs between each other. And the other figure that we can see really just giving a visual breakdown of those five, um, across those five themes. What isn't shown as an example on this slide is below these, and we also have a breakdown of the threats and activities as well. So across the six activities and the threats that are included from well watching noise management um, through to entanglement and ship strikes, you can also see the breakdown um, across of, of those activities and threats. So if you need to redirect resources to um, to fill any gaps in your management plan, you can focus on specific activities or threats that might be occurring in and around your marine protected area. So once you have those results in terms of what do we really do with those results, um, and I've mentioned about doing snapshots or sort of assessments over time, I like to show this um, infographic because it, it, it helps to, to better understand the benefits of using the self-assessment tool um, over multiple time series. So if we take year zero, uh, when the MPA was established, you may do your full assessment. Um, you may receive a, a score of 3.4. Based on those answers and based on the understanding of the threats um, of the gaps and strengths in, in the management plan, we can implement or take um, informed management decisions to address those gaps um, to uh, better improve the, 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 the management of marine mammals. So once you've undertaken those steps, you can then do a reassessment again in year three and then hopefully, because of the actions that you've taken, you may see an increase or hopefully see an increase in not only your management score, but in the figure below, we can we can see that the scores across all those five themes have um, improved. And then it's the same again um, for year six. Um, the years or the, the, the frequency that you do the, the assessments um, is entirely um, defined in the management plan and, of course, up to the MPA managers. So where are we at the moment? So the self-assessment tool has been used by 24 uh, or 25 now actually marine protected areas, um, which spans across 19 countries. And these range from uh, large uh, sort of uh, transboundary MPAs. They also consider uh, preliminary assessment. So analyzing the draft management plan. So we've seen that in Iceland and we've also seen that in and we've also seen that in Bermuda as well for the uh, development of a marine mammal sanctuary. But we also have been used um, in existing MPAs, um, such as Stellwag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary, who use the toolkit, uh, the self-assessment tool to evaluate or reevaluate their management plan, and also in the Agoa Sanctuary as well in the Caribbean. So I won't go through all of these, but I think it's always important to note that not only is it ourselves that have developed this toolkit say that it works, but also um, from the experience of our partners and other MPA managers that they have also um, seen uh, successes from its use. So I've mentioned the Goa uh, and Selwagen. It's been used in Bermuda um, to develop a management plan for a uh, for a Bermuda marine mammal sanctuary, which will hopefully span the entire EEZ of Bermuda. Um, SPREP have suggested using the SAP for the development of a marine mammal sanctuary in Samoa. Um, and it's also been used by the um, Eros uh, Natural Marine Park in France as well um, in the review of their current uh, management plan. And as Francis mentioned, um, hopefully we'll see the first MPA in Iceland being designated, which will um, be designated uh, in part following the use of the self-assessment tool. So just very quickly, that's a very quick, rapid overview of the full self-assessment tool. However, within that full self-assessment tool, there's, there's approximately um, around um, 120, 150 questions. But we realize that not everybody has the resources and the time to undertake a full assessment continuously. So we developed um, a reduced version, which is called the satellite. The aim of the satellite is to be a rapid assessment of a marine protected areas management plan. It can be used to understand if a full assessment is required, or it can be used in between full assessments. So in, if you remember that infographic of year zero, three, and six, you could then use the satellite in years one, four, um, and seven um, to understand um, how the MPA um, uh, management plan uh, is performing with respect to the management of marine mammals. 
The satellite has around about 50 questions, um, but it works in the same manner as the self-assessment tool. So they're drop down uh, uh, answers and then you select um, the most appropriate answer. Where the satellite slightly differs um, is that we will ask you um, for your perceived level of concern with respect to various uh, threats or activities in the MPA, and you can rank them based on high, medium, low or none. Um, and based on your answers, some of the questions will change in the SAT light, depending on your responses. So really trying to speed up um, the efficiency um, of this rapid assessment. And just like the full assessment, you will also receive a dashboard. It's slightly trimmed down in comparison, but the key things on this dashboard, not only do we have the radar plot, but on the right hand side, you'll see two tables and then a big orange button. So again, you can see the breakdown across those five themes. You can also see your perceived threats against various activities. And based on your perceived threats, um, you will be uh, pushed towards taking action to review one of the fact sheets. But importantly, at the top, should I complete a full SAT? This will change based on your score. So if you score relatively low in the SAT light, this would recommend that you undertake a full assessment. On the other hand, if you score fairly well, it will suggest to maybe review some other resources based on some possible uh, gaps that have been identified, um, but maybe you don't need to undertake a full assessment and maybe you uh, don't need to allocate resources. So it's it's quite difficult to, to go through both of those tools in 15 minutes, um, but hopefully it's giving you a little flavour. But if there are still questions, of course, we are still available um, to answer all your questions. But also on the website, you will also find um, this flowchart as well, which has various questions on the left hand side. And then you can follow um, the lines through to whether you need to look at the fact sheets, undertake self-assessment tool, and also what happens uh, once you've um, completed the full SAT or, of course, the SAT light. And just as I said, our email is there on the screen. You can access the toolkit on that URL. Please do contact us um, if you have any questions or need assistance in undertaking the self-assessment tool, but also um, in answering the questions and actually implementing the self-assessment tool. So that's all from me. I can see there are some chats, but I've not, I've not looked at them. But if there's any questions, please do hold on to those. And um, we do have some time um, shortly as well. But before we, we move into that, as I mentioned, it's, it's OK saying uh, from myself and Francis talking about the toolkit and the benefits of it, but I think it's very valuable um, to hear firsthand um, from its use. Um, and as such, um, I would like to give the floor to um, Dr. Makami Makami uh, with to provide you all with a testimonial on the use of the self-assessment tool um, with MPAs in Zanzibar. So, uh, Makami, um, happily, the floor is yours. We can see your screen, Makami, but you're still on mute. Okay, thanks everyone. Good, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, I'm speaking from uh, Zanzibar, as I have been introduced. My name is Makame Omar Makame, uh, Director, Department of Marine Conservation. This is a department within the Ministry of Blue Economy and Fisheries in Zanzibar. So our department So our department uh, manage uh, five marine conservation area. I think uh, as you understand, Zanzibar has got two major islands. So we have uh, four marine conservation area in the main island. We call it Dunguja, or sometimes we also call it Zanzibar. But, and we have the other one uh, in Pemba. We call it Pekka, Pemba Channel Conservation Area. Uh, the area, they are very rich in terms of biodiversity. I think there was a lot of uh, explanation about Indian Ocean in Zanzibar as well. Uh, most of these areas are imas, especially pekas, MBCA, 
and the Mimkas is where most of the uh, marine mammals are visiting. Uh, and uh, is where we have most of the dolphins. So uh, as it has been mentioned earlier, uh, we Zanzibar, we have uh, tried or we participate in this uh, in SAT, Marine Mammal Toolkit, and we did, we did it for three MPA, MPCA, Minai, uh, Minai Bay Marine Conservation Area, Peka and the Chabamka. This is just a, a snapshot of uh, the structure of how we operate between the department and the, the marine areas uh, that I have mentioned earlier. So these are the resources we have, for example, socioeconomic we have uh, within area, uh, these resources cut across the all five MPAs. Of course, some of the resources are not here. We have uh, cultural issues like historical ruins, ecological sites. Uh, we have scenic like small islands. Uh, these two big islands, they are surrounded by more than 50 small islands. So one among the scenic in our marine conservation area, small islands sandy beaches, sandy banks, numerous bays and mangrove inlet. In terms of biodiversity, we have marine mammals, whales, dolphin, dugong. Dugong but it's, it's not much, but there is a recent uh, many sighting of dugong, particularly in Pekka. Uh, whales is, is like, a, we can say, it's a seasonal. Uh, mostly visiting our show in uh, August, September, October. It's where we have uh, a, a, a large number of whales in our in our ocean, and uh, many studies uh, have indicated, probably uh, very close to uh, to Zanzibar, is probably there is a a breeding site because. Uh, during this time, we normally see large number of uh, we, we, we can say the baby whales. We apart from bigger ones, but we also see large number of baby whales on our sea. We have whale sharks, of course, mangrove forests, seagrasses, coral reef, fish fauna, uh, endangered and threatened and protected yeah, species. So our goal uh, generally we can say is to restore and conserve the diversity, abundance and ecological integrity of all physical and biological resources in our MCAs so that they may be enjoyed and used productively and sustainably by present and the future generation. So as I said, we, we have uh, implemented the toolkit in three of our marine areas. And these are the, the results. So you can see marine management uh, dashboard, especially in the marine uh, management group score as has been uh, in, a, in a presentation, earlier presentation on the toolkit. You can see uh, the ma maximum score is 278. But for this time that we have tried, we have score 43. So you can see management effectiveness score is 1.55. This show that we, 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 we haven't done much in terms of uh, uh, to deal with the threats. We haven't done much in terms of research monitoring 10, uh, 10 years back. There was a lot of research uh, and monitoring uh, pertaining the marine mammal, special wells, but recently most of these activities are uh, we are not witnessing it. So we we score poorly in terms of research, as well as uh, an outreach we do, but it's not that level we have. So that's why we we score thirteen. Uh, management effectiveness we score four, for example. Uh, so you can see uh, 
the 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 the, the score uh, is very low compared with the maximum uh, 200 so if you go to specific on uh, effectiveness score of uh, of management you can see the uh, in terms of uh, figure you can see as well in terms of management framework like activity and the threats is where like we really uh, currently we have a big gap uh, research and the monitoring as I said we have done a lot previously but not not currently because we had the WWF and others stakeholders they have done a lot previously but not now so you that's why you see we have we have score a, a very little. And then uh, if you go spe uh, on threats specific, you can see again, uh, what dolphin and watching, uh, we scored like uh, very little or zero noise management. Currently we, 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 we don't have a, a guideline in place or regulation in place that uh, dealing with noise management in terms of well or in terms of dolphin. Entangle uh, entanglement, again, is an issue. We do have a kind of a, a awareness creation, et cetera, et cetera, but we really don't have this in our guidelines because sometimes when we, we get phone call uh, from the fishers that there is a well that has been entangled within the uh, fish net. So normally there, are, there will be a fight between our rangers and the community, but the community, they, don't, they, they want to kill it and get uh, meat, et cetera, to get, they say they can get oil out of it. So there is limited awareness, but also we don't have a, 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 a regulations or guidelines that really direct rangers or direct uh, our, our, our community or fishers or how to deal with this situation. Of course, marine mammal bycatch, especially for dolphin is a big issue, but we, we, we currently, we, we only give out like directions, but we don't have regulation in place, guideline in place on how we do this. When, for example, when we get a phone call from a community that is a uh, there is a, a tangle well, then we don't have a special, our ranger, they don't have special training that could be able to deal with this. They can just do like based on experience, but they are not really trained in terms of uh, a, a better way of doing that. So you can see we have, uh, see this uh, SAT, it help us a lot. Uh, okay. terms, yes. Sorry. Sorry, so Michael, key, you can continue, sir. Okay. Key importance of uh, this tool to our MPAs is like this tool provided objective data that help to identify our strength and weakness. As I have going through the the results, you have seen. Uh, the weakness we have, the strength that we uh, we have currently, but the the, the toolkit, uh, the overall score is very low, as you have seen in all management categories and assessment. But it helped us in several ways, because now we since we took this uh, the, this uh, assessment, we have now develop a lot of uh, uh, ways on how to fill it. I'm sure maybe after three years, four years, we, we will raise our score. But there are issues. We have started to think of uh, on, on how to, to, to work on it and to, to strengthen our management. So the, 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 the tool help us to understand our existing situation with regard to marine mammal conservation and management. But uh, generally, I can say it is an eye-opening kind of experience taking this tool. Uh, it was like, it helped us to, uh, to, to understand where we are 
and what we are supposed to do for us to be able also to contribute to global efforts toward conservation of marine mammals, but not only global efforts, because marine uh, Zanzibar is, is like, is, uh, we can say it's getting a tourism booming. And uh, most of the tourists visiting our areas, we can say maybe 90 or 95 percent of, uh, of tourists that are coming visiting our area. So we need to do something to improve their experience. Although they have, as it has been mentioned earlier, the marine mammal has put in importance ecologically, but it is very important in terms of livelihood, it creates jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So we need uh, to, do, to, to do something based on what we have seen, the gaps after taking, after taking the the, the uh, these are a few things that we in the in the short term we have planned to at least to, uh, to do to improve our management in, in terms of marine mammals. For example, uh, we have planned to have a sanctuary for dolphin because now in the area where we have uh, many dolphin, the number started to decrease. And uh, even some tourists or some tour operator, they don't take their guests there because it's very chaos. We don't have a proper uh, kind of arrangement, but also there is a, a big issue of illegal fishing. So we need to create a kind of zoning uh, where we could, uh, we, we could have uh, a kind of sanctuary for the dolphin. This will improve the habitat and probably uh, the dolphin will come back. So the other thing we, we have planned in, in, in near future is launching a formal world tourism. Currently, we don't have a, a formal world tourism. By introducing this, it will force us to, 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 to do a lot in terms of management, in terms of noise, et cetera, et cetera, to, uh, to, to have a regulation, what type of ports should be used, who is supposed to Take tourists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these, uh, so introducing this world tourism uh, formally will assist us to to fill some of these gaps we we have identified through the SAT. But also, we have planned to develop guidelines and regulation to assist conservation and management of marine mammals, issue of entanglement, noise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera having a, a special unit uh, that will be dealing with the entanglement of wealth, but also we need to increase the resources allocation. So all these we can't be able to achieve if we, we, we don't put more resources in, 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 in issue related to marine mammal. So I think uh, these are the, the, the issue we have planned to start with, but I, I hope maybe as I said, Maybe within three uh, or four years, uh, we will be somewhere in terms of creating good environment for marine mammals, put very good uh, management practice, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for that, uh, Sante San. Thank you very much, Makami. That was excellent. And I think really demonstrated uh, the, the value of using the, the self-assessment tool in, in, in not only understanding um, the current status of, of, of management plans, but also being uh, enabling future planning and, and identifying key activities um, for, for next steps um, to be undertaken with respect to the, to the conservation of, 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 of marine mammals. So again, thank you very much um, for coming. So, Thanks, so I, I do note that, that, that we are um, sort of coming towards the end of a webinar and we are slightly behind our, our, our scheduled agenda. However, I do want to just open up uh, the floor if, if, if there are maybe one or two questions um, from, from participants um, for, for, for any of the, the speakers, um, please do raise your hand. Um, I do know there have been some questions um, in the chat that have been um, that have been answered um, as well. So um, maybe just a few moments for people to gather their thoughts. Um, so if you do have a question, please do raise your hand.
Okay, so I'm not seeing any any hands being raised. Um, but again, the, the chat is open. Please do drop your questions um, in the chat. Um, and one of the speakers, uh, Francis and I, if it's about the toolkit, will have, will have crossed um, come back to you as well. Um, and please do just note as well, Francis um, has um, added the contact email for the Marine Mammals Management Toolkit. Um, if you do want to reach out to us as well by, um, by uh, email. So moving on uh, to our closing remarks, um, I'm pleased to um, give the floor back to uh, Dr. Maher. Uh, to provide us uh, with some closing remarks and just round off um, our webinar. And just before you take the floor uh, from here, if, Makami, if you can stop sharing your screen, um, that would be excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, Dr. Giuseppe, Dr. Mukami. Uh, and thanks to all my colleagues in Belshka uh, region for attending this uh, important webinar. And the, uh, I can uh, uh, say that uh, early in this year, 2023, Perska got uh, a full-size project from the World Bank on the sustainable fishery development in the Red Sea and Gulf Adar, is fish. Through the second year of this project, we will update, develop, and support of, of uh, implementation of regional action plans for conservation of marine mammals from fishing activities. The objectives of this study or this consultancy is to review existing conservation and research programs and legislation at a regional and national level, also identify significant gaps in scientific knowledge develop cooperation of research and the monitoring of these key species and highlight the scale of environmental threat that must be mitigated to ensure more effective conservation measures and also develop regional action plans for marine mammals or updated the national uh, ones that occurred in uh, British member states and to build, uh, build relevant institutional and human capacities to prepare and update these conservation action plans and encouragement of fishermen to use fishing methods and technologies that minimize by catch of these key species and the charismatic uh, megafauna. And finally established platform and the forums on fisheries conservation measures addressing marine mammals. And also, finally, we will try to use and apply this important tool kit in the next phases for marine mammals in uh, Persica region or in the Red Sea and uh, Gulf of Aden. Finally, thanks for your all, and it's uh, nice to be to see you all, and uh, the floor for your uh, uh, turn to close this important webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahir, and, 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 and again, thank you to, to all the attendees and especially all the speakers for your for your rich contributions and um and, and as well the, the reflections that we heard from um Somalia and Kingdom and Saudi Arabia. So just before I just before I close this, um if anybody, any of the attendees would like to receive an attendance certificate recognizing that, that you joined this webinar, and then please do uh, reach out to myself and Francis. Um, and we will um, have that um, over to you very shortly. Um, and just finally, just a, a reminder of the various contact pieces of information. You have the email on the screen, um, the, the URL for the toolkit. If you would like to join our newsletter, you can do. Um, and also in the top right, you can join the community of practice. So um, with all that being said, again, I would like to thank um, Perska for this for this rich collaboration. Dr. Mahir for your, for your support in making this happen. Um, Giuseppe, uh, Makame as well for, for, for your presentations, your reflections and your um, very interesting points. And to everybody um, online, uh, I wish you a pleasant rest of your day and thank you very much for joining us.